Welcome to the Myth and Magic Authors Podcast, folklore and fantasy topics aimed at creative storytellers. To write stories and challenge your brain with exciting ideas, delve into these presentations and reflections. See how fantasy realms are based on actual world history, legend, and lore. Study fairy tales, nature fables, and supernaturalism to engage in a jumble of concepts that will trigger your fancy and get you writing imaginatively. Now, here's your host, Neil Mack. Hello, myth and magic fans. So, just... 10 days to go before Christmas and um, continuing on my theme of Christmas connected myth and magic ideas. What do you think the most beautiful castle in Europe is? The most beautiful castle in Europe connects myth and magic, history, prehistory, fantastic, fabulous and current affairs all together. Now, if you're an American writer of fantasy fiction, or you're an American reader, you might have wondered why fantasy fiction focuses so often on a theoretical medieval Europe. And you might even have wondered if the medieval Europe of fantasy fiction is perhaps false. And to be fair, it seems that the disnification of our memory hasn't helped much to disentangle the truth from the fiction. And we know that at least half of Disney's most beloved films have been set in a speculative fantasy medieval Europe. And this includes even recent films. So Brave is set in Scotland, Frozen is set in Norway or Sweden, Maleficent is set in England, Of course, the much-loved Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella are both set in Germany. Beauty and the Beast is set in France. The Little Mermaid, although it should have been set in Denmark, was set in Switzerland. And even one of the most iconic structures in the Disney universe, the Cinderella Castle, is based on an existing royal castle. And I would like to contend to you today that this castle, Cinderella's castle, is the most beautiful castle in Europe. But I warn you that you may not like what I'm about to to say next, especially if you consider yourself to be a rationalist. So here's the warning. Be ready for what I'm going to say next. It would be a mistake to assume that the Europe of fantasy writers and the Europe of Disney is imaginary or counterfactual. Because it's not. Because it's real. Yes, it's wonderfully, perhaps even hauntingly real. It's fantasy land. And I live in it. Now, I know that you may well be saying, I don't believe you. And I've told you this before, and it's worth repeating. I live in an absolute monarchy, and I've covered that term before in a previous show. I live in an absolute monarchy, and I live only a couple of miles from where a real-life queen sits in a tower inside a thousand-year-old castle. Just get that into your head to start with. This queen, this real-life old queen, she keeps a golden ship near my place, which she uses occasionally to row down the River Thames near my hometown. And that river, by the way, is named after a very ancient, almost buried in the mists of time, water god called Temisis. Her home, this castle I'm talking about, which is also a palace, sits atop a mighty mound. And this mound provides supernatural energy to her and her family. And... The castle she lives in is only one of several castles that she uses. And if she takes one of her usual rides using uh, one of her fleet of carriages and horse and carriages through the local town of Eton, then this queen will see schoolboys dressed in towel coats 
who attend a school that looks more like Hogwarts than anything you could ever imagine, and I guarantee it. And this is all now, in December 2020, as I speak. What I want you to understand is we Europeans coexist with our history in a way that establishes a f special fusional relationship between fables and myths and our real and current world. To try to understand this, I would like you to try to guess how many castles you think there are in Great Britain. Go ahead, I dare you. How many castles do we have in this mighty realm? Now, we know the Queen lives in one of them, and we've also covered the fact that she's got several others scattered around the place. How many do you think there are? How many castles do us Brits pass on our way to school, or our way to work, or our way to the shops, or our way to the offices? Can you guess how many castles there are in Britain? Well, if you can, you're clever, because nobody actually knows for sure. That's how many we've got. Historians still quarrel about it, and they kind of settle at a figure of around about 1,500 castles. The Principality of Wales itself has the highest number of castles per square mile in the world. It has over 500 castles in such a small country. And that makes Wales the epicentre of castles in Europe. But Germany has the most castles of any country in the world. But France and Spain and then Great Britain are very close behind. And what are they like, these castles? Well, as for splendour, you probably can't beat Frederick Spohr Castle in Denmark. But for impressive and ancient, you probably can't beat Windsor Castle, where the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II still lives. It stands out as a remarkable place. But for magic and mystery and darkness, what about the HM Tower of London? Now that's one hell of a castle. And for romance, you can't get much better than the Eileen Dornan in the western highlands of Scotland. But today, I would like you to introduce you to the most beautiful castle in Europe. It's in Bavaria, in Germany, and it's called the Neuschweinstein. Neuschweinstein. Not only is Neuschwanstein so architecturally magnificent that it inspired Disney's castle, it inspired actually Sleeping Beauty's castle, but it also meets my conjecture that we Europeans live alongside our history in a way that creates a special interplay of fusions between the allegorical and the mythological and our current prosaic real world. And the castle of Stein was built recently. This noble castle was commissioned by King Ludwig II of Bavaria as a haven created in the honour of the German ring composer Richard Wagner, who lived between 1813 and 1883. So this castle was built at the end of the 19th century. Now that may well sound like a very long time ago to you, but to put it in perspective, as a teenager, I had an aunt who was born in 1870. So she was present when this place was still being put up. So basically, it's yesterday in terms of castle building. This castle, the most beautiful castle in Europe, was built basically yesterday. If you go to the tall citadel now, uh, so I'll put a photo on my website at neilmach, N-E-I-L-M-A-C-H dot me, you will see its Roman or Norman Romanesque features with skyscraping arches and proud towers that point up into the Alpine blue and exalted pinnacles, all built around enormously surreal, eagle-soaring heights. It has titanic dimensions. But the thing is, this place is not just a Disneyland castle. It also cuts across the gaps between history, modernity and mythology. This place blurs the boundaries of what is real and what is magical and even what is halfway between. This is the wonder of the castle. Sadly, although it was a glorious tribute to Richard Wagner, the ring composer, he never actually visited Neuschwanstein. 
and much of the castle remains unfinished, although it looks finished on the outside, I admit it, inside it's only half built. But if Richard Wagner had ever visited, he would have seen a performance hall where his operas would have been sung, and he might also have visited the famous Venus Grotto. Now this is a cave, it looks like a real cave, but it's artificial, it has stalactites, and it's located on the third floor. And this cave is inspired by the legend of Tannhauser, who was a mythical knight who supposedly found Venusberg. And Venusberg is the underground home of Venus. So in other words, this mythical knight visited the other world of classical legend. And inside the castle is a replica of the Venus Grotto. Now, so get your head around that. Inside a castle, which was only created at the end of the 19th century, is a replica grotto that goes all the way back to the Venus of Rome and the Aphrodite of Greece. Now, upon, upon retiring to this uh, grotto, visitors, if you go there today, you can do this, you can still move around in this uh, liminal darkness. And you can see for yourself that you can travel from one dimension to another. I don't say that easily. But it is magic, because if there's singing going on in the concert hall, which is situated right above the grotto, and that singing is most likely going to be Wagner, and it most likely will be some kind of mythological story that they're singing, and you're standing in a grotto, it links you with times gone. So this castle connects fable and legend with modern life. And if you wanted to prove that link any further and further still, there's a link between history, prehistory and legend. What about the fact that looted artworks stolen by the Nazis during World War II were stored here at Neuschwanstein? Hitler planned to open an art gallery in the castle after the war was won. And he had collected several rare, several magical and several powerful symbols. Luckily, uh, after the Allied victory, the United States troops discovered 21,000 stolen items hidden inside the castle. They found altarpieces from churches, private jewellery taken from prominent Jewish families, and vast amounts of furniture. So much loot was found inside the castle that they're still, to this day, cataloguing it. And like I say, the castle is linked backwards and forwards in time. It's not the only castle, for example, that was located here. Schwanstein Castle was here long before the place we see now, but that was demolished to make way for the Disneyland Towers. And that castle, Schwanstein, sat upon the remains of an earlier one, and that one on the remains of an earlier one still, and so forth. In fact, this area was settled in Roman times, and they probably put their own fortress on top of a existing prehistoric mound. The area later became a favourite summer resort for Prince Bishops, and this astonishing place links St Magnus of Fusion with the winter nymphs of the Rhine Maiden and the Viking Valkyries and the dragon slayer Sigurd and, of course, the Roman goddess Venus. And all this was created in the mind some say the mad mind, in the mind of a fantastical fairy tale king known as the Duke of Franconia, the Duke of Bavaria, Ludwig II. And Ludwig II was a direct descendant of a German Bavarian dynasty that ruled Holland, Germany, Sweden, Romania, Bohemia, Hungary, Denmark, Norway, Greece, and the whole Holy Roman Empire, and gave rise to the Royal House of Windsor. Thus, the current British royal family, Queen Elizabeth II and her heirs, the family which reigns over Britain from Windsor Castle now, are connected to the castle of Neuschwanstein. His throne and his castle connects all these things together. It has associations with magical treasures. It has associations with precious holy relics, holy swords, the loot of the Nazis, the royal families of Europe, and the oldest beliefs which go back to Vikings and before that to Celts and to Iron Age people 
and to Romans and to Greeks. Yes, you can go and visit it today. And yes, it was built in my great aunt's lifetime. And that's why I personally think it's the most beautiful castle in the world. Now, if you want to learn more about um, the Nazi loot um, and hiding it in Neuschwanstein, then I recommend you watch The Monuments Men, which is a film uh, 2014 starring George Clooney. And if you have um, any other comments or you'd like to make your own uh, suggestions for what you think is the most beautiful castle in Europe, or in fact the world, let me know. Tweet me at Neil Mac, N-E-I-L-M-A-C-H, or one word. Oh, grandmother, what big eyes you've got. Continuing my little pre-Christmas study into fairy tales that have a connection with this uh, very mysterious and magical time of the year, I wanted to look into the timeless story that's told by Brothers Grimm, but in particular by Charles Perrault. All these uh, stories were taken from local legends and traditions that had been around for centuries, probably as early as, early as the Middle Ages, before the Brothers Grimm and Charles Perrault found them. And they were told and retold around campfires and in caves <laughs> and on top of mountains across the whole continent for generations. These storytellers, the Grimm Brothers and de Perrault, simply collected the tales as they travelled around the towns of Europe. But French author Charles Perrault, which is spelled P-E-R-R-A-U-L-T, is the inventor of what we now call the fairy tale, and he was the first person to collect the story of Little Red Riding Hood in the form we know it now, and uh, that was in 1697. The brothers Grimm collected their stories uh, a little bit later than that, but Perrault adapted the story of Little Red Riding Hood as a warning to readers um, or to listeners about men who prey on girls who walk in the woods. And he concludes his fairy story with a cautionary uh, word, a warning if you like, when he says, be careful if you haven't learned that tame wolves are the most dangerous wolves of all. But the story of Red Riding Hood shares many similarities with the legend of classical Greece and of ancient Rome. And the scholar named Graham Anderson compared the story we know now, Perrault's story, to a local legend that was told by a Greek traveller known as Pausanias, who lived in the second century AD. The story he told was about a town that each year offered a virgin girl to a malevolent spirit that had been dressed for some time in the skin of a wolf. And the malevolent spirit would each year rape the girl and, no doubt, devour her. But fortunately, on this occasion, uh, the hero, Euthymios, arrived. He cured the spirit, stole the wolf pelt and married the girl. And there was a happy ending. The girl in this much older tale was called Pyrrha, P-Y-R-R-H-A, which means fire or red fire. And the malevolent spirit was called Lykos, or wolf. And the dialogue between the big bad wolf and the little red riding hood that we all know so well has analogies um, with the ancient Norse tale of when the gods dressed Thor as a bride. Can you imagine that? This huge Viking dressed as a bride after a giant had stole his hammer and then had then demanded that they hand over a virgin bride as a reward for its safe return. So Thor arrived at the giant's um, castle dressed as this virgin bride, but the giant was wary. And the reason the giant was wary is because the bride who was presented to him had huge unladylike eyes, massively wide mouth, and had a desire to eat all the food and glug all the drink in the castle. So he wasn't a particularly convincing uh, virgin bride. Anyway, I'll leave you to find out what happened in the rest of the story. But the theme of a rapacious wolf and a creature that's released unscathed 
from its belly is also reflected in the Russian tale of Peter and the Wolf, and of course it has similarities to the biblical story of Jonah and the Whale. The story could also be superimposed on the story of St Margaret of Antioch, who was swallowed up by Satan, although Satan in the story took a dragon form, but she later emerged alive from its belly. Now it's worth noting that early variations of the tale used a werewolf rather than a real wolf as an antagonist. And the red, the symbolic red in this story, the red of the hood, could be a symbol of the natural solar cycles. This is possibly why we do think about this story at this time of the year, because the red hood could represent the sun as it is finally swallowed by the terrible night and the terrible darkness, the wolf at around Christmas time. And yet she is cut from the belly of the wolf to represent sunrise and the emergence of the light that enters the world after the winter solstice to start a new year, to start a new life, a life of light. So although this symbolism is bacon, it can also be translated into a Christian meaning. And the tale can also be interpreted as a puberty rite. The girl leaves the house, she enters a liminal state because she's going through the processes of puberty. She goes through the various acts in the story and transforms into an adult woman and returns to her new existence as a woman when she emerges from the wolf's stomach. And this is possibly why the red symbolism is also in the story. Now, if you've got any other comments about Red Riding Hood or any of the uh, fairy tales, let me know. Tweet me at Neil Mac. And if you want to learn more about the state of liminality, I do go into, it, into quite a lot of detail in my new non-fiction book, which is titled So You Want to Write Fantasy? And it's out now. But otherwise, keep in touch, keep safe. Think about what you're going to do this Christmas. I suggest you uh, do not edit that book if you have been uh, writing a book during NaNoWriMo. Make sure you leave it until January or February to edit it. But enjoy yourself and stay in touch. And I'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>